Ladies and gentlemen, when we are talking about diplomacy, power and wealth, it is worth taking a closer look at the holdings of the Kunsthistorisches Museum that were amassed and handed down by a number of outstanding collectors of the Habsburg dynasty. For centuries, the Habsburg were one of the politically most influential families, a position which is also reflected in their large princely collections. Extensive international contacts and corresponding financial resources allowed them to demonstrate their power and wealth through the high artistic quality and variety of artworks. One of the most important collections of this kind was assembled by Archduke Ferdinand II at Ambras Castle in Innsbruck. Archduke Ferdinand II was the second born son of Emperor Ferdinand I and therefore a nephew of Charles V too. This very representative painting made by Jakob Seisenecker shows the prince at the age of 19, one year after he was entrusted with the governorship of the kingdom of Bohemia in his father's place, residing in Prague. After his father's death in 1564, he became sovereign ruler of the county of Tyrol for a period of around 30 years. Ferdinand raised both courts, Prague and then Innsbruck, to remarkable high levels of cultural attainment and excellence. To house his collections, which even then, in the 1570s and 1580s, were widely famous he had a special museum building constructed that has been preserved at its original location to this day. This makes Ambras Castle the oldest museum in the world and an incomparable cultural monument of the Renaissance. Today the collections belong to the Republic of Austria and are partly displayed at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna and at their original location at Ambras Castle in Innsbruck. So, first of all, I would like to show you this extraordinary place. A clear image of the location is provided by Matthäus Merian's copper plate engraving of 1649. In spite of its late date, it still reflects the architectural reality during Archduke Ferdinand's lifetime. The engraving is the oldest known view of the entire complex of the castle. The inscription at the bottom of the picture refers to the individual buildings and their function. We can identify the so-called upper castle, which was used as living area for the Archduke's family. Then the big hall, later known as Spanish Hall, used for princely representation. Then, the buildings that housed the princely collections. The library on the first floor of the granary building, the so-called Kunstkammer, and finally, the armories, with an additional wing for the heroes' armories. Here you can see the situation in our days with the upper castle, the Spanish hall, and the museum's buildings. I apologize for the bad quality of this slide, but it was taken out of a film. It's a film still. Uh, this pen and ink drawing made by Joris Höfnagel after a sketch of Alexander Colleen from the 1580s features the earliest known appearance of the term museum in connection with the castle of Ambras. The inscription placed above the castle reads, I should have a detail, Castrum Amaras, a serenissimo archiduce Ferdinando Austriaco extructum in quo et eus biblioteca et museum. Translated 
approximately as the castle of Ambrose built by Archduke Ferdinand, in which are his library and his museum. This very close connection between museum and library as a kind of an encyclopedia of universal knowledge also accorded with the thinking of Samuel Kickeberg of Antwerp. Kickeberg was a Flemish theoretician who wrote in 1565 the earliest known treatise on collecting and museums, a kind of guideline for assembling an ideal princely Kunst and Wunderkammer. Although we do not know exactly when Archduke Ferdinand began collecting, the very fact that Kickeberg mentioned him personally in his treatise in 1565 as exemplary collector indicates that his collections were in existence by then or were at least in the process of being assembled and that they were known throughout Europe. But how did Ferdinand acquire his collections? In addition to his material inheritance, he received donations and diplomatic gifts and later also made important purchases from other collections. Ferdinand was an excellent net worker, benefiting from his family connections, the contacts with ambassadors that these brought with them, as well as from agents, middlemen, merchants and courtiers. The buyers included the imperial ambassadors in Venice, Genoa, France, Constantinople, and Madrid, just to mention a few of them. The Archduke also relied on the services of his son, Cardinal Andreas, who was asked by his father in 1578 to purchase not only, I quote, all kinds of armor of noble Roman commanders, but also antiquities from Rome. This approach to acquisition applied equal, equally to all three areas of Ferdinand's collections, the armories, or to be more precise, the Heldenrüstkammer or Heroes Armory, the Kunstkammer and the Library. But here today, we will focus on Ferdinand's Kunst und Wunderkammer, which is among the best documented collections of its type. The most important source for its content is the inventory of a state of 1596. According to it, there was the diverse universe represented with native and exotic natural products and the creations of human workmanship, nature, and art, from which the collection categories Naturalia and Artificialia emerged. I quote from the inventory, in the large chamber of art, there are 18 various high cupboards. Thus begins the description of the Ambras Kunst und Wunderkammer in the inventory. After that, it lists the cupboards from the first up to the 18th and the two cupboards that were turned sideways. There also seemed to be a hier hierarchical categorization, since the most precious objects of rock crystal and gold were stored in the first cupboard, silver items in the second, handstones in the third, and so on. However, the principle of organization by material is in any case undermined by individual objects that do not meet that criterion, not to mention the organization of six cupboards containing musical instruments, clocks and automatons, books, various items and guns. The cupboards were densely packed and each had up to 13 shelves. There were objects even mounted on the back of the cupboards and frequently on the inside of the double doors. The ceiling of the Kunstkammer was hung with preserved animal specimens such, such as fish and reptiles along with their bones and teeth. Paintings were hung densely on the walls. 
And today, since the 1970s, groups of objects from Ferdinand's Kunstkammer have been on display in the rooms of the former library. They are presented by reviving the original principle of display cases, while at the same time doing justice to the demands of modern museum visitors. Little remained here of the superabundant overflowing that characterized the display of Ferdinand's Kunstkammer. Here the cupboard with the corals and with uh, stone, marble and alabaster and also two um, vessels of uh, rock crystal. By means of a visualization, the last year's exhibition dedicated to Archduke Ferdinand II attempted for the first time to allow the holdings recorded in the inventory to be viewed how they were originally displayed. Some 3,000 objects mentioned in the inventory bring the collection alive, virtually alive, to the eyes of the today's visitors. Here I have some more examples <coughs> with the cupboards and this one. In the first cupboard, there were the most valuable objects. I quote from the inventory, first cupboard painted blue, in it all kinds of crystal objects mounted in gold and also dishes entirely of gold." End of quote. Among them, we find four precious gifts which have been presented by the French king to Archduke Ferdinand. They were the world-famous golden salt cellar made by Benvenuto Cellini, the lidded goblet called the Michael goblet, the onyx ewer, uh, no, not the onyx ewer, the Burgundian goblet and the onyx ewer. To start with the so-called Saliera. The world famous golden salt cellar is the only extant piece of gold work by Cellini and one of the greatest masterpieces of art. Cellini's design is intended as an allegorical representation. The two godlike figures seated opposite each other represent Neptune, water, and Tellus, earth. Neptune is accompanied by a small ship for salt, <coughs> the white gold of the sea, while Tellus <coughs> has a temple by her side for pepper, the black gold of the earth. Other allegorical depictions complete the complex iconography, sea and land animals, the four winds, the four times of the day, and so on. The piece is executed in gold, partly enameled. Cellini also put ivory balls into the ebony case on which the sculpture could be rolled back and forth on the table, showing its complexity to its best advantage and allowing it to be viewed from all sides. The Saliera was originally commissioned by Cardinal Ippolito d'Este of Ferrara, but having seen the model, he dismissed it as infeasibly. It was the French King Francis I who finally commissioned Cellini to execute it in gold. Cellini finished it by 1543 and handed it to the king, who, to quote Cellini's autobiography, gasped in amazement and could not take his eyes off it." End of quote. The precious salt cellar remained in the ownership of the French king until 1570. This year, his son, King Charles IX, married the Habsburg princess Elizabeth. During the marriage ceremony in Speyer, Germany, the bride's uncle, Archduke Ferdinand, stood proxy for the bridegroom. As thanks, the French king presented him with gifts through the agency of his ambassador, the Count of Retz. And here it is. Along with the Saliera, the second and third spectacular gifts were the Burgundian goblet, 
Burgundian goblet, and the lidded goblet, the so-called Michael goblet, on the right-hand side. While the Burgundian goblet previously passed from the estate of Charles the Bold to the French royal treasury, the magnificent vessel of the Michael goblet was purchased directly for the French royal treasuries in 1533 from a dealer in Antwerp. Both splendid goblets are captivating not only for their material richness, we are talking here about rock crystal, gold, pearls, enamel, diamonds, rubies and emeralds, but also for their balanced and elegant design. Finally, the fourth French gift was the onyx era. Its exquisite gold work and sophisticated gem cutting make this a prior work of the courtly French art of the second half of the 16th century, namely of the master craftsman Richard Toutain the Younger. For this year, he used existing pieces of onyx, combining them with enameled gold to create a thoroughly homogeneous vessel. Today, all the four are masterpieces of the Kunstkammer in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. We owe their survival to the lucky fact that parts of the collections of Ambras have been transferred during the French wars in the Tyrol in the 19th century. The treasures of Ambras were evacuated in 1806 to the Imperial Holdings in Vienna, where they still can be uh, admired in the museum, not in the imperial uh, uh, holdings. There's another group of objects uh, that has been almost predestinated to express princely power, even worldwide power. As a result of the increased contact between Portuguese seafarers and non-European cultures, which began around 1500, many artifact, artifacts, products, and animals from Africa, India, Salem, and Japan came to Europe. Through family ties with Portugal, the Habsburg benefited from their alliance with this kingdom, whose power and hegemony extended over half the globe. These exclusive objects passed from the Portuguese overseas to Archduke Ferdinand in Ambras. In the inventory, they are stereotypically classified as Indianish, Indian. We describe them today as exotica. Maybe you know Hanno, Suleiman, or Emmanuel. These three elephants with nicknames were the best known pachyderms and among the most luxury and famous diplomatic gifts in the 16th century. It was King Manuel I of Portugal who first set the trend in Renaissance Europe <clears throat> by collecting state elephants. The Portuguese demanded tribute from Asian vassals and the kingdom of Fiafna in Ceylon was expected to send 10 elephants yearly to Portugal. Elephants were symbols of kingship absolute power and wisdom, underscoring Manuel's claim to global rule. Recalling the parades of antiquity, Manuel wrote triumphantly, triumphantly in the manner of Asian kings through the streets of Lisbon. In 1514, King Manuel presented Hanno the elephant as a gift to Pope Leo X in Rome. Here is Hanno, uh, a drawing by Raphael, now preserved in Berlin in the Kupferstich cabinet. The other two elephants, Suleiman and Emmanuel, however, were gifts given by Manuel's daughter-in-law, Catherine of Austria, Queen of Portugal since 1525, to her grandson, Don Carlos of Spain. Later, they came in the possession of her nephew Maximilian II, the brother of Archduke Ferdinand, and entered his menageries in Austria. 
Initially, Suleiman came to Lisbon as a gift from the King of Cote in Ceylon with the entourage of the ambassador Sri Ramaraska Bandita on a diplomatic mission in 1542 with the aim to solidify political ties with Catherine's husband, John III of Portugal. Along with the living elephant, the ambassador brought the first ivory fan and other diplomatic gifts like caskets, combs, rock crystals and jewels made in Cote with him. This beautiful <coughs> fan carved from ivory tusk from Archduke Ferdinand's Kunstkammer can be undoubtedly identified with one formerly in the collection of his aunt Catherine, the Queen of Portugal. Her inventory of 1554 describes it as, I quote, an ivory fan with 22 blades and the handle which has four carved lions, two on either side. The handle and two of the blades richly carved with figures, foliage and other work. A small gold button holds the fan blades, end of quote. The fan remained, oh, here we have a detail. The fan remained in Lisbon until Catherine's death in 1578. After Philip II took over of Portugal in 1580, objects from Catherine's collection were appropriated and either taken to Spain or given away as gifts to family members, as it was the case with this fan. Philip sent it to his cousin, Archduke Ferdinand, to Innsbruck, together with a considerable number of exotic artworks, for example, Chinese porcelain. This was in return for the military aid with troops Archduke Ferdinand gave Philip for his Portuguese military campaign in 1580. In the Ambrose inventory of 1569, the fan is mentioned as follows, I quote, in a long black case covered in leather, a lovely, quite artistic ivory windmaker with a beautifully carved long handle. <laughs> the top of the fan is shaped like a peacock's head with 21 today, <laughs> thin blades affixed now to a horn button. The massive handle is partly carved fully in the round and shows an Indian goddess, vegetal motifs and animals with an unclear meaning. Due to its fragility, the fan was of no practical use. Fans in Asia and in the Far East were considered rare articles and in Renaissance Europe became symbols of elevated social rank. Catherine, Ferdinand's aunt, who lived in Lisbon, played really a key role in the, procure, in the procurement of exotic animals, luxury goods and other rare products for her extended Habsburg family in Spain, Central Europe and the Netherlands. The art historian Anna-Marie Jordan Schwendt, an expert in Catherine, named her the Merchant Queen. Factors, agents, merchants, Portuguese officials and foreign potentates in Portuguese, e in Portuguese Asia, Goa, Cochin and Malacca and in Africa were recruited to buy, to buy exotic animals for her and rarities. Through her network she fulfilled requests she received from Habsburg relatives. By the way, Catherine is also one of the protagonists of our recent special exhibition in Ambras Castle. I'd like to show you here uh, the poster. Oh, that's uh, Queen Catherine and a painting executed by Anthony Smor from the Prado in Madrid. And here the exhibition uh, poster. The exhibition, uh, curated by Dagmar Eichberger and Anne-Marie jordan Schwendt, sheds light on an unknown side of female patronage in the history of art. It focuses on three remarkable women, 
Archduchess Margaret of Austria, governor of the Burgundian Netherlands, and her nieces, Mary, Queen of Hungary, and the mentioned Catherine, Queen of Portugal. The exhibition will run until October the 7th, and an English catalogue will be available soon. So <laughs> if you are inspired by this, you're welcome to visit the exhibition. Equivalence to the elephants in terms of their value and symbolic power were rhinoceros. Both of them were a kind of pachyderm superstars in the 16th century. The first living rhinoceros since antiquity came likewise to the court of Manuel I of Portugal as a diplomatic gift. It had been presented from the Sultan of Gujarat in 1515. King Manuel passed this gift on to Pope Leo X. What is stately present for His Holiness? In Rome, it was to meet with the Indian elephant named Hanno, whom I mentioned and showed before, to test the theory already suggested by Pliny, namely that these animals are deadly enemies. But the battle of these giants was not meant to be. The sailing ship was damaged off, was damaged off the Ligurian coast and the rhinoceros drowned. A very sad story, and up to that date, such an animal had only been known from ancient written records. In order to make sure that this animal received due attention everywhere, a detailed report from Lisbon was issued to German merchants soon after its arrival. This report included a depiction of the creature, which was later to become the basis for one of Albrecht Dürer's most popular works, the great Reno woodcut, which was printed in 1515. Even though Dürer did not see the rhinoceros personally, but rather created it from pure imagination, his depiction defined the conception of the appearance and character of this rarely seen animal until the late 19th century, giving it a mystical aura. But for 16th century collectors, as it was the case with the elephant, the animal's principal interest was its horn, the exotic appearance and great material material value. This made it a sought-after item for Renaissance cabinets of art and naturalia. Then as now, powdered rhinoceros horn was traditionally held to be a powerful medicine, a aphrodisiac in the Chinese cultural area. Therefore, rhinoceros horns in the Renaissance were expensive and very, very exceptional. I would like to give you just one example from Ferdinand's Kunstkammer. This cup was probably brought, uh, bought in Lisbon by Hans Kebenhüller, the imperial ambassador in Spain, where he assumed the role of art dealer for his Habsburg patrons, <coughs> among them the emperors Maximilian II and Rudolf II, and also Archduke Ferdinand. Kebenhüller, a true Renaissance man with, cultivate, with cultivated tastes and a discerning eye, he was responsible for the acquisition of exotic goods and jewelry, which he shipped under very difficult circumstances from a to Central Europe. He resided in Lisbon from 1582 to 1583, where he also obtained for Archduke Ferdinand II bezoars and uh, medicinal stones. The gilded base and the lid of this cup, surmounted by a reclining lion, is finely executed with chiseled strap work, wines, grapes, deer, and birds, recalling identical motifs applied <coughs> to black lacquer furniture exported to Goa from South China and the Ryukyu Islands in Japan 
and sold in Lisbon. Together with ivory, rhinoceros horn, coral, tortoiseshell, and mother of pearl belong to the main group of animal substances that featured in many art objects in Archduke Ferdinand's collections. The same cup bought with the ivory uh, items. There's no clear evidence of the provenance of this mother of pearl vase, but it most likely derives from the Ambras collection of Archduke Ferdinand II, who kept numerous works in mother of pearl in the Kunstkammer, as spoons, plates, judges. Standing on the mother of pearl ring, here it is, uh, the bulbous body of the flask is made of wrought copper and faced with mother of pearl plaques made from the shell of the marine snail Turbo Mamoratos, Mamoratos uh, of which we heard yesterday. The neck consists of a double layer of mother of pearl plaques in a pattern resembling fish scales. The method of production indicates that it was made in the Sultanate of Gujarat. Gujarat was one of the main centers of the creative objects made from mother of pearl that were created for both export trade and domestic market. To conclude, as an offspring of one of the leading dynasties of the 16th century, Ferdinand's collection reflects his princely identity and promotes the extensive power of the Habsburg too. Not only the precious and rare objects themselves demonstrate the claim of power, but also the way how they entered his collection underscores this equally. Yeah, and to learn more about this, I invite you to travel to Innsbruck and have a look at Ambras Castle. Thank you. Thank you.